Hey guys, and welcome back to the Young Investors Podcast. This is episode 36, and joining me as always is Brandon. How's it going, Brandon? Uh, it's going very well, uh, except for the fact that I'm getting a little bit sick. <laughs> oh, no. we'll, we'll struggle through. Have you avoided right. getting getting a cold so far? To the I start have. Of I've had minor sickness recently, uh, but I think that's more just burnout from just oh, right. <laughs> doing a lot of work and that just, sort of thing. Yeah. But no, I've avoided the dreaded flu and I've avoided... Uh, any kind of major cold, and uh, it was actually my birthday this week, which was yeah, uh, happy exciting. birthday! Woo-hoo. Thank you. Yeah, what did you get? Older. Did you get what any did good, I get? Good presents? Uh, just a lot of money, really. A lot Not of a money. A lot of money. That made it sound <laughs> just a lot just of a money. Lo- no. <laughs> Small loan just of a million money. dollars of what? Ten million dollars. <laughs> <laughs> yeah no um no it's good every time i get money for birthdays or anything i'm just like counting the number of stocks that i can buy with it so, yeah like, what can so, i get yeah, no, what, there you go. Wh- where can i go shopping <laughs> no that's not what we're talking about today we're not talking about well we are i guess we are talking about that today we're talking about bad money habits yeah, we are. So, uh, we're going to, of course, start off with the industries and we'll go through some news topics. And then in the major section of this podcast, we're going to talk about money mistakes and how to avoid them. So, uh, there's obviously a lot of uh, mistakes that we've, some that we've made and some that we see other people making. <laughs> um, and uh, we want to talk about them and how we think uh, you can best avoid them and best sort of, I guess, handle your money. Yeah. Um, and towards the end, we'll do a couple of Q&A questions. And of course, uh, if you're listening to this uh, on Spotify or iTunes and you have a question that you want us to answer in next week's podcast or you have a topic or something like that, then go over to youtube.com forward slash Hamish Hodder and find this uh, video format of the podcast and leave a comment. Uh, and we just pull all the comments and we chuck them in. And uh, if there's any kind of big topics, we usually cover them. So if yeah. you have anything like that, then uh, go ahead and do it. Yeah, for sure. All right, should we get uh, stuck into it? Yeah, go for it. Do you want to take us through the indices? Yep, this one won't take very long (laughs) (laughs) because in America, we've got the Dow was flat, the NASDAQ was flat, and the S&P 500 was flat. (laughs) <laughs> wow. Absolutely nothing. I was really surprised because I was looking at um, at the charts of the last five days hmm. and there's a whole lot of jumping around in the last five days, but basically all those indices started and ended like at exactly the same point, like within just a few points, which is ridiculous. I've like never seen the start and finish after a week be that close together. So wow. there you go. So they literally are very flat. <laughs> Conspiracy. <laughs> yeah, because, yeah, why? <laughs> why is it so? Um, but in Australia, things are a bit different. Things are looking good for once. Jeez. All Ordinary is up 2.5%. Um, actually, sorry, I got that what, the wrong way around. ASX 200 was up 2.5%. All Ordinaries was up 2.4%, but much of a muchness there. So mm. good week for Australia. Very good week. You don't yeah. often see a 2.5% week. That's uh... Yes, especially without any help from the US, that's for sure. <laughs> it's very true. It's very true. We usually have our <laughs> biggest weeks when the US is just roaring. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, not to be this week. Yeah, it's weird how closely related that that is, like just globalization, I guess. How dependent we are on the US, I guess. Anyway. Yeah. Um, yeah. So that's the indices. Not very exciting, but um, not not too bad of a result for here in Australia. Hmm. Now, news. Donald Trump did an oopsie. <laughs> he did a big oopsie too. I, I've, oh. I haven't seen what he's done. I haven't been uh, watching the news. Yeah, so tell me. You'll have to... He met, uh, met with the Queen and with Prince Charles... And he got very excited, so excited that he wanted to tweet about it instantly. And um, he happened to call Prince Charles the Prince of Wales, W-H-A-L-E-S. Oh, no. (laughs) (laughs) How funny is that? Donald. Donald, what are you doing, man? What are you doing? (laughs) Called the Prince of Wales, the Prince of... (laughs) Wales. And then there's just so many, like, all I'm seeing at the moment is just meme upon meme upon meme of, like, photoshopping Wales onto Prince Charles and, oh, Donald, what are you doing? Literally, there must be nobody checking this guy's tweets yeah. before he makes these tweets. That uh, that absolutely amazes me because there is so many people who are obviously much less high profile than the President of the United States that have yeah. teams that 
do this stuff for them and make sure that people don't make stupid mistakes. Yeah. And then I mean, there's Elon, just this Elon guy. Musk got forced to have someone check over his tweets before he tweeted. I mean, yeah. he's just the CEO of some public company. It's like he's not the president of the United States. <laughs> but there you go. Good on you, Donald. Jeez. Uh, Oh, How no. does any American have confidence in this guy? Seriously. Yeah, he's uh, he's not doing too well in the polls actually at the Isn't moment. Isn't he? He's getting he's, he's uh, getting smashed. Is yeah, he? Joe Biden from the Democrats yes. is ahead Joe. of him. A uh, Joe Biden, sorry. Yeah, my, Joe my Biden. Bad. Um, <laughs> Joel. Joel, uh, <laughs> good old Joel. This is how much no, we no, know no. about. No, Actually, American it's his younger politics. brother, Joel, who's, uh, yeah, he's. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, but yeah, Joe Biden's beating him in the polls. Um, although I mean, Hillary was beating him in the polls, and then yeah, that and thing then that happened. happened. <laughs> So. <laughs> oh dear I don't know I reckon that uh, Joe Biden's got a pretty decent shot um, just th- just through the fact um, that he was working with Obama and that kind of term- turned into a massive meme <laughs> so now everyone knows who he is mm, true but, yeah we'll uh, see we shall see yeah anyway next news story um, this is kind of just like a broad thing that I observed uh, this week when I was looking for news stories is that at the moment there just seems to be just through all the news sites, there's just a whole lot of fear around a recession and worsening economic conditions and, you know, tight, you know, our beautiful run in the stock market's almost over and that kind of thing. And I just wanted to talk about just how negative some of the new or just how most news sites are now really predicting that this is the end of the road. So there's, I basically saw two articles that were talking about um, bond yield cur- curve inversion on the same site and how that kind of leads us into recessions and that sort of thing. Hmm. Um, I saw another article which was kind of interesting because it explained it for dum-dums like me, um, talking about like how the interest rates are going down in Australia. And we discussed this last week, didn't we? I think we did. Yeah, and we did. The, yeah, yeah the, the cash rate was cut to 1.25%, down hmm. a quarter of a percent. Yeah. Um, And I think that they said that that's the lowest that interest rates have ever been in Australia. And it was an interesting article. They talked about kind of the reasoning for that to try and help stimulate the economy. But in reality, when you actually look at the Australian economy, it's growing at its slowest rate that it has in 10 years. Mm. Um, And another thing that I learned as well is that um, despite the jobs growth number actually being decent in the last year there's actually a record number of people that are looking for work at the moment and right. eight yeah 8.6 percent of australians are what they call underemployed which is basically where they don't get enough hours where they want to work more but they can't and the article basically went on to talk about how you know th- this fact that you know there's uh, too many people seeking work that kind of keeps um, wage growth down and then that obviously discourages consumer spending and then obviously that doesn't help stimulate the economy at all mm. so it's kind of this um, this kind of snowball I guess or this kind of uh, this pattern of one thing leading into another leading into another leading back into the first thing it's right like a circle the, the economic circle I don't mm. know <laughs> yeah that's really interesting because then sort of the unemployment figures look really good I think they're the best that we've had in quite some time everyone's yep. got a job but in yep. terms of uh are people looking for more work are people getting enough hours um mm. there's a significant amount of people who are underemployed so yeah it's interesting how that keeps wages down because people are they're shopping basically for work and uh, that yep. means that employers have more mm. more choices from yeah. people to choose from and it means that they can uh they can pay less for yeah. employment and it yeah. keeps keeps wages down, which is really interesting. It's an interesting yeah. situation to be in where everyone has work, but everyone wants more work mm. uh, or everyone wants to work for more money at least. Yeah. And then, yeah, they just, you know, they let the people that are happy earning less to work more of those hours because mm. there's just that much competition, which I thought was really interesting. Um so that's kind of that news story. And then the last news story that I chucked in here today was uh, following on. I wanted to chuck this in because we talked about it uh, last week, which is how we're talking mm. about short selling and how short sellers try and spread, you know, the fear into, into you know, general investors and that sort of thing. So Tesla actually had their shareholder meeting following up from that example we were talking about last week. <clears throat> and remember how we were talking about one of the main issues was that... Um, the, all the short sellers are just pushing the fact that there's a huge demand problem for Tesla because their Q1 deliveries were down on their Q4 2018 deliveries. Yeah. 
Yeah, so essentially Elon comes out and says in this shareholder meeting, look, there is absolutely no demand. <laughs> like, he literally says there is absolutely no demand problem. It, um, it, it was pretty funny. He, uh, he kind of just stood up there and was like, there's no demand problem and just like laughed. <laughs> yeah. <he laughs> and everyone laughed. was just like, everyone just clapped. <laughs> yeah, basically. Yeah, it, it was ridiculous. So did you watch the whole thing? I watched a significant amount of it. I didn't watch yeah. all of the Q&A and I didn't yeah. watch all of the start, but I watched all of Elon Musk's um, part in that, yeah. in that meeting. That yeah, all it was actually a recurrent theme in the Q and A as well. Just right. talking about how the how the media is just skewing Tesla in such a negative light. But yeah, absolutely no demand problem. He was saying how they had fifty thousand new orders in the quarter, and um, and that that number was orders from people that aren't already mm. reservation holders. So it's an entirely new set of fifty like fifty thousand new people have placed mm. orders. Yeah, I think that's really important because it's one thing to say we don't have demand. Look at all of the reservations we've got. But if those reservations were booked from you know such a long time ago, it does sort of still raise questions as whether there's new customers coming into the yeah. market, new people uh, demanding these cars, and there is. Uh, yeah. And Elon cleared that up. Yeah, clearly. Um, yeah, he was saying that, you know, they're still um, getting more orders, there's more demand for their cars than what they can make at the moment. And another interesting thing is that they were talking about, you know, this demand cliff, how it was super popular, and then all of a sudden now, it's just not popular anymore. Like, Q1 deliveries were down, it's just not popular anymore. But... Over the last 12 months, the Model 3 was the best-selling car in the US by revenue. And in its mm. class, it beats all of the other major brands combined in terms of unit production or unit sales, rather. So it's just, it's a ve it's very far-fetched to go ahead and say, look, this number one selling car in the whole of the United States is now all of a sudden completely out of favor. <laughs> <laughs> with the people in the US, even though basically every review you see is that the Model 3 is like an amazing car. It's like, ugh. If you're uncertainty in doubt, let's spread it as much as we can, right? Yeah. I, I mean, it happens to other businesses all the time as well. I mean, this is yeah. not in any way the same thing, but it's the same thing in in when we're talking about short-term news overpowering the stock. So back in 2015, I think up until that point, Apple's iPhone sales had been record sales every quarter. And then they had yep. one quarter where it didn't beat the previous quarter or year over oh, year, right. it looked a little bit bad. And right. there was just so much news coming out about Apple, about the iPhone's done, everything's going to shit. <laughs> and yeah. uh, the stock fell quite considerably in that time. And I think that's when Buffett actually started buying into the stock when it was it fell below a hundred dollars per share. Yeah, and that's crazy. Uh, yeah, it's and then of course iPhone sales just went back up. <laughs> yeah, and they continued to grow. And is that right? It's just the short term news, isn't it? Yeah, and it's interesting how people can get so caught up and zoomed in on one quarter year over year and uh, use that to dictate the future of the stock. Even though you know, for Apple in Apple's case, they'd been growing iPhone sales for a long time seven years or so so uh yeah. yeah the same i mean it's not obviously not the same tesla's obviously much newer but uh it's true i mean just because you have one quarter where the demand's a little bit lower and we you spoke about this last week how it was it wasn't even really uh it was more related to the fact that they were fulfilling international orders yeah uh, and that and that sort of thing so yeah it's it's really interesting how the news is uh I'll, I'll, i'm very curious to see if the news switches around i'm sure it is going to uh, yeah, it, it, al knows? it always does. <laughs> yeah, I mean, eventually, maybe. I mean, there's so so many shares being held in the short position that it mm. doesn't look likely anytime soon. But um, yeah, like if they come out and say and just like can objectively prove that they're having like they had maybe they'll have their best quarter ever or something. And I mm. think Elon was saying they have a good chance, they have a decent chance of producing their best quarter ever um, coming up in in this quarter. So. Um, yeah, I guess if that happens, then there'll be no choice, I guess, but for the narrative to turn the other direction. But um, it's interesting, like as we we're saying in Tesla's case, it's just it's amazing how much share price pressure can be put on a stock um, just through this kind of stuff. So yeah, um, very interesting. Do but you, yeah, that's sorry. You, well, you, I was just going to say, do you know when the uh, next quarterly earnings come out for Tesla? Uh, no, I don't. I imagine what's it, March. Made you so it'd be after it'd be after this month, so after the end of this quarter. Okay, cool. <clears throat> yeah. Well, that'll yeah. be uh, interesting we'll have to, to talk about. Yeah. Yeah, we'll have to wait and see. Yeah, yeah. Um, all right. So that wraps up the week of news, and next up, 
we're going to be talking section two of the podcast. We're going to be talking about money mistakes and particularly how to avoid them. Because a lot of people, I don't know about you, I see a lot of people making a lot of money mistakes. <laughs> and to be honest, like I uh, rewind the clock maybe four or five years before I was, you know, had done so much research on how to grow money and that sort of stuff. I probably made a whole lot of these mistakes myself. Um, and just looking through our podcast notes, I know that I have made some of these mistakes myself. So it would be good to talk about them. Yeah. Um, do you want to lead us into the first um, first point? Yeah. So the first one is very relevant for us as the Young Investors Podcast, and it yeah. is uh, not investing your money. So I think this is a huge mistake that people make. And mm. uh, I mean, it seems really simple, but so many people just don't do it. Uh, and the thing is, if you just start investing even a small amount when you're younger and you can consistently do it over the very long term, the difference isn't just a few hundred dollars here and there in terms of your portfolio in retirement. I mean, it is uh, day to day, but at, it, when you get to retirement, it's it's millions, if not you know thousands, if not millions of yeah. dollars that you're you're taking off the table that you're that you're sort of going without just because you couldn't invest, you know, a hundred dollars a month even. Um, I mean, I did some maths. I did this quite a while ago actually, but. So I can't remember the specific numbers, but even just investing $100 per month from the age of 20 until retirement can build you a portfolio of over a million dollars. Yeah. So it's, yeah, it's, it's crazy that such a small amount consistently can uh, make such a difference to your retirement. Yeah. I did a, um, a little kind of researchy thing, or I did a little bit of study not too long ago, and I was looking at um, if you invested $10,000 a year and you got the average, just the average market return each and every year, but you started at 30 years old, or if you started at 20 years old, um, and I found that basically if you started at 20, investing your $10,000 a year, getting that average market return and compound interest working away, then eventually at 60 years old, you'd be snowballed up to about 2.15 million at the average market return, so 2.15. But if you started 10 years later, that same strategy of um, $10,000 each year into the markets, it gets you about half of that. It only gets you $1.02 million at the time that you're 60 years old. So like Mm. start at 20 years old, 2.15 million, start at 30, only 10 years later, and it's basically halved down to 1.02 million. So... It's pretty crazy and definitely that's why like the people that I see in the comments that are like, hey, I'm, you know, 15 or 16, I'm getting switched on to the idea of, um, you know, turning my money into more money and investing. I'm like, man, you have a huge, they even have a huge advantage over us yeah. just being like five, six, seven years younger than us. Like they, that's going to equal a lot of dollars. It won't equal a lot of dollars right now, but it'll, it will equal a lot of, a lot of dollars of difference down the line, like when we're 60, 65, getting ready to retire, because the key, obviously, to the success of your investing is how long can you keep going for? Mm. How long can you keep compounding your money for? Because at the end of the day, it's the last years of the compounding that are the that, that are the most crucial, that earn you the most money. Yeah. I, I mean, in the earlier years, the most important thing is to save and invest as much as possible, because uh, let's say you have a thousand dollar portfolio. The interest on that portfolio, maybe if you get a market average return, might be a hundred dollars, for example. Yeah. But you could just save an extra thousand dollars and double your portfolio size. So when you're starting yeah. out, saving and investing as much as possible is important. And then towards the end of it, what will matter is the return that you're getting. Because if you have a portfolio yeah. of a million dollars, uh, the re- if you get a market average return, then that could be a hundred thousand dollars increase in size of your portfolio. Whereas you're probably yeah. not going to be able to save an extra hundred thousand dollars. So when yeah, you're starting exactly. out and when you're younger, the return that you're making on investments isn't a huge deal unless you're, uh, you know, making stupid investments in gambling and losing money. As long as yeah. you're investing in a broad market index or you're investing in safe investments, uh, what what's really important is just how much you can save and how much you can set aside. And I think that a lot of people get scared of the stock market or investing and they don't really understand what it is. They might think it's just gambling or you've just got to make a bet towards a company and then you, you, you either get lucky or you don't. That's really not yeah. what investing is about. Uh, that's yeah. something else that we'll talk about to in the, later in this uh, in this <laughs> podcast. Uh, but when it comes to investing, we're talking about 
making sure that we know we're going to make a return over the long term. And if you don't really know what you're doing, the best way you can do that is just to completely diversify in the market. Uh, and yeah. that's really easy. There's even single stocks called exchange traded funds where you just invest in it. It's just one stock that you invest in and it invests your money in the entire market or even multiple yeah. markets. Yeah. No, I agree. I agree with you there. Yeah. If you don't, yeah, like if you don't want to pay attention and try and figure out what a good individual business is, like if you just get into a market tracking ETF, then you'll get the average and mm. the average is still really good. <laughs> So, yeah. And there's also other alternatives. I mean, most some people might not find the stock market the best way to invest their money. So, you can invest in real estate and real estate's got a little bit of a higher barrier to entry. Uh, but if you can yeah. get your foot in the door of real estate, I think that uh, for many people, it's going to be the best investment that you could make because it's just like a forced savings account. You make mortgage yeah. payments that you have to pay. You don't have a yeah. choice. And every time you do it, you have more equity in the property. You own a higher percentage of that property. Uh, and uh, yeah, I mean, at the very least, I tell people, if you really don't want to invest, if you're really that worried about it, then at least put significant amount of your cash in a high interest term deposit. Yeah. Because there's term deposits where you can lock your money away for three, five years. And if you've just got extra savings and you know that you're not going to need it, then just put it in a high, lock it away for three or five years and yeah. earn two and a half, three percent. Yeah. Um, and at least that way you're making a small amount of money and it's not just sitting in a checking account or a transaction yeah. account and earning nothing. Yeah, basically, at least just do do something to make sure that you're not going backwards, at least. Just do something. <laughs> That's at the end of the day, just do something. Ideally, investing is going to be, I reckon, the easiest and best way mm. to make money in the long term. But then again, I am pretty biased. But I think objectively, <laughs> I, I would agree with that as well, like trying to take bias away. I think that investing in stocks is certainly, as a, as a passive investor, certainly the easiest way to set yourself up for a long-term wealth creation. It's easier to set up than, say, a property portfolio. Yeah, I think it's... I think it's certainly easiest for uh, you to get in as a young person because you don't yeah. have to put that much money on the line. You can yeah. just put $500 in and you can get used to the feeling of what investing is. Yeah, that's it. 500 bucks is all you need. That's the minimum marketable parcel is what that's called. But um, once mm -hmm. you've got 500 bucks, like, it's better than needing, what is it, 10% of uh, of, uh, of the value of the property or something like, who mm -hmm. knows what that is, like 50000 or $40,000 or something like that. Who knows? Yeah. So yeah. big difference, hey? <laughs> Very true. And moving on, uh, I think there's probably only one thing that's worse they're not investing. Um, and I just mentioned it just before, uh, and that is speculative investing. Guilty. So, <laughs> so yeah, what is what guilty. is speculative investing? Speculative speculative investing, it's kind of a bit of a, yeah, a an oxymoron, <laughs> isn't it? <laughs> yeah, it doesn't really it doesn't really make sense when you think about it, but you know, we'll go we'll run with it. Yeah. What I should say is speculating in the market versus investing. Yeah. Uh, so the difference sort of Benjamin Graham's definition is probably my favorite. Um, and essentially he describes an investment as one where uh, you're highly confident that you're going to make a satisfactory return and that you're going to get uh, your initial investment back at the very least. So it basically means you're investing where you've done the research and you rationally know that you're at the very least going to make a decent return. Uh, yep. And anything else, he says, is speculating. So yep. uh, an example of speculating uh, would, well, a clear example is Bitcoin. So yep. back in, when was this? 2017, I think. Yeah. Maybe start of twenty, maybe throughout twenty seventeen. I think it sort of started in twenty seventeen when it really got hyped so. up. I think um, so. Yeah. And you had people just sort of saying, "Oh, I just bought this, and then a week later, I made twenty percent. Uh, yeah. So I bought some more." And that was really all of the research that people were doing was just looking yeah. at the price movements, and we're not even really looking at the price movement, just just looking at it and being like, oh, well, this one looks like it's going up a lot. Let's buy it. Or this one's only yeah. 0. 0.1, 0. 0.00001 cent for a, for a light coin or a doge coin. <laughs> so so is, let's yeah. just buy this. And if it goes up 0. 0.00001 of a cent, I'm going to make 100%. Um, yeah. And uh, that's not investing. And that is definitely the one thing that's worse than not investing. Don't think that you're investing if you're going to, do stuff like that because yeah. 
that's by far worse than not investing because more likely than not, you're going to actually lose money rather than yeah. even just maintain your money. Yeah, just go to the casino. Just, <laughs> yeah, I mean, honestly, just put it all on red. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's, that's literally, yeah. <laughs> like, speculative investing, like, for me, it's like my worst investments have always been the ones that I've speculated on. And, mm. yeah, I've, me like... Too. I think everyone's been there, especially maybe early days. Like we've all had that stock or that company where we're like, "Oh, this could be a very, uh, very lucrative invest or spec- speculative buy," I guess. Mm. <clears throat> but more often than not, they do not work out. <laughs> so you really are, you really are better suited to just finding strong, solid businesses and making sure, even if they're boring, like that's the thing, speculative investments or speculative buys are just, usually they draw people in because they're so exciting. They offer the world, maybe the business is really exciting. But at the end of the day, sometimes it is better to go with the business that might be drop dead boring, but at least you, you're you fairly, um, fairly confident that you won't lose money and you'll just get a satisfactory return. Because really, as Warren Buffett always says, like the, the key to stock market investing is just getting a satisfactory return, but also not losing money. Like it's it's less about making huge amounts of money. It's more about just ensuring that whatever you buy is not going to lose you money. And then from there, if you can get a satisfactory return, then that's all you need. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I mean, the portfolio that consistently can make a decent return over the very long term will always outperform one that has, you know, high returns in some years and low and negative returns in in other years. Uh, I mean, just look at the richest people in the world. Most of them are business people who are have invested their entire life safely in one business because they just run that business, or they're an investor in multiple businesses. Uh, but there's no one who's become, you know, mega rich just speculative gambling. <laughs> yeah, there's no one who's just a gambler <laughs> in the stock market who's just like sitting on billions of dollars because yeah. all it takes is one bad gamble to lose yeah. everything. Um, and that's yeah, it's exactly feeds into what Warren Buffett says, which is just don't lose money. <laughs> that's yeah, like your first, that's like the first step. Don't lose money and only make investments where you're really confident that you're going to make at least uh, a, a satisfactory return. Yeah. Yep. So yeah, basically first two, not investing your money. That's a pretty bad mistake, but even worse, buying into speculative businesses or basically we we could just call this just gambling, yeah. gambling in the stock market because gambling is not a great strategy. <laughs> nope. Um, the third money, uh, money mistake that I wanted to talk about as well. And this is one that I just see just around me in, in my friends and just in people that I know is lifestyle creep. Lifestyle mm. creep is a killer of wealth. It it will destroy your long-term wealth. And lifestyle creep is basically where as you progressively earn more and more money, as say your maybe your salary gets higher or you move to a different job and you start earning more money as you get older and you get more experience and that sort of thing, your spending habits also become more expensive because you're getting more money. So, I don't know, say you're working a casual job. An example of this would be you're working a casual job and because you're not earning very much money, maybe when you go out and buy some food, you maybe you go out and buy dinner, you buy a Subway. And then a couple of months later, you've now got your full-time job, you're earning heaps more money. So, instead of going to Subway, you start going to this fancy restaurant. And, you know, maybe you, you know, scale up again in, into a different business or a different job rather and you get even more money. You're like, oh, why not? I've got heaps of money now. I mm. might go and buy a nice car and then I can rock up to this even fancier restaurant in a bit more style and we can really have some fun. And it's just this creep, this lifestyle creep that really kills people's ability to generate long-term wealth. Mm. The people that get... <clears throat> The people that get really rich are the ones that progressively snowball their money and they earn more money. They go to different jobs. They start earning more, but their lifestyle doesn't change. So even though they're earning, say, maybe they went to a, from a casual job to a full-time job and they're earning maybe triple the amount or quadruple the amount of money that they were earning in their casual job, they still live with the same lifestyle, the same frugal lifestyle, the same habits, and they don't let you know, this lifestyle creep seep in where they start living in even more and more luxury as they start earning more and more money. Mm. One thing that I've noticed with people is that 
I think a lot of people have sort of a minimum benchmark in terms of their bank account where if their bank account goes below that, they're kind of like, oh shit, I better start saving. I better stop spending. And then once it exceeds that, they kind of feel comfortable and they're like, oh, I can just, I can spend a little bit more money. And the first thing I would tell people is to figure out what that number is for you, because what will happen with a lot of people, and I think this is why lifestyle creep happens, is that that benchmark doesn't move, but your income goes up, which means that say your benchmark is $500. If now you're earning a full-time, you're working a full-time job and you're making two, $3,000 a month, $4,000 a month, you're going to far exceed that amount really quickly. And it makes you feel really comfortable. Uh, and it yeah. makes you feel as though you can just spend money anywhere. And I think the best way to avoid this is to just raise that bar with your income. <laughs> so yeah. raise your what you feel comfortable with having in your bank account. If you're now earning $5,000 a month, raise that up to, you know, I have to have 10,000 in savings. I have to have 20,000 in savings. And yeah. raise that minimum bar up because a lot of people don't raise that bar and they always exceed it with their income and then they're just happy to spend, spend, spend until it reaches that and, th- and then they start to worry about money again. Yeah, yeah, lifestyle creep, it's a killer. It's an absolute killer. I like that strategy though. Or even if it's just like, even if you go about it a different way and you get paid and then immediately you drag some of that money, you know, a certain portion of the money you get paid out into a savings account. Hmm. Yeah, if, if you're getting paid more money, then make that amount that you're dragging out of your bank account into your savings account, make that higher. Mm. Just like do do some sort of strategy along those lines um, to make sure that you're saving more money. So then whatever's left over is uh, for, you know, for you to spend. Maybe it's a little bit more, but yeah. it's not like, oh, look, I've got like four grand extra that I can blow now. What am I going to buy with that? Yeah, so lifestyle creep, it's killer. Um, kind of following on from that, kind of in the same category as lifestyle creep that you've mm. put down, spending money on clothes. Well, spending money on... on <laughs> you, need <to> spend, <laughs> you need to spend money on some clothes. What do you, what do you mean, Brad? Naked. What do you mean? <laughs> <laughs> hey, this is your point, so I'll let you take this one from here. Off you go. No, I just, I just never understand why people spend so much money on clothes. This is a killer yeah. for so many people. People buying new t-shirts, new jeans, new jackets, just like yeah, every week. Crazy, people spend. Uh, I mean, for me personally, I've never been the kind of person who spends money on clothes. So I'm kind of lucky in that way that I've just never, I've just, you know, I just have my two t-shirts or whatever, like not two t-shirts, but like, you know, five, five t-shirts. You know. <laughs> just, just wash those same two t-shirts. <laughs> just, just look in my closet. There's one t-shirt, one yeah. pair of pants. One pair of shoes, on, one pair of socks. One of your t-shirts says Monday, Wednesday and Friday <laughs> on it. <laughs> no, but I mean, I don't go shopping very often at all. Just, nah, just, when I, just when I really need to. But what I quickly discovered was that other people spend a lot of money on clothes. Some people yeah. are going shopping every week. Every time they go out, they need to buy new clothes and they can't wear the other clothes again because God forbid someone sees you wearing the same pair of jeans. Yeah, I know. Two weeks know. in a row. God. I can't believe it. I had a friend that was like this once and his his excuse was always, oh, I've got to be looking fresh. Looking <laughs> fresh. Yeah. It's like, mate, you literally, you wear your t-shirt once and then you don't wear it again. You get a new t-shirt. Yeah, yeah. I, I always got to look fresh. It's like, oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. And by the way, I did just change the, the heading here to, I instead of spending money on clothes, spending money on excess clothes. Mm. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's just... I'm never, it's just one I'm never going to understand. I mean, yeah. uh, well, I guess we can combine this with the next one. It's another one I'll never understand is people buying expensive cars when they can't afford it. So, yeah. I mean, I mean, I'm Crazy. fine with people having expensive cars if they've got, if they've got that FU money, if they've got, you know, yeah. their, their, their retirement is sorted, their, everything's financially good in their life. Yeah. If they're and set. They, yeah. And they, they, for they want yeah. a nice car. Why not? You know? Yeah. But people buying expensive cars either on lease or on financing yeah. when they've just got their first full-time job or, you know, blowing their entire savings on an expensive car, that is another one that I'll never understand. 
Yeah, and it's something that Ted brought up in the podcast, Ted Richards, a couple of weeks ago. He said mm. that this is one of the biggest wealth killers that he personally sees is people uh, or the young people he was saying around the football community when they start getting this massive, you know, these massive paychecks, they start buying these flashy cars. And that's another way where you just see that lifestyle creep. Like these guys are running into a whole lot of money early on in their life. And instead of saving and investing and doing that, and they're buying these massively expensive cars. And I think he was saying that he was switched onto these financial concepts and even late in his footy career when he had done a lot of the earning you know earning of his money in his career he was still driving a Toyota Corolla like good on him that's the way to do it yeah (laughs) I mean for for me personally what I've found is that I've had interest in these things and I've kind of used things like an, an expensive car as kind of like a goal as like a as a reward for working hard and making more yeah. money but when i ever reach those goals like if i reach this goal i'll buy this or like yeah. I, I can afford this whenever i reach there i just find myself no longer interested in buying that thing i yeah. just i just want to continue to compound my wealth like i don't want to stop yeah. it i don't want to set myself back by buying something that's essentially a liability i mean clothes not so much you kind of just spend it and the money's gone but a car yeah. is an ongoing outflow of money you're paying yeah. for petrol especially if it's an expensive car you've got huge insurance premiums on that yeah uh, if anything goes wrong if it's a european car and you're buying it in australia <laughs> have fun with uh repair costs yeah someone good bumps, luck servicing that someone yeah. nicks your bumper you know you, yeah. you you set back a lot um yeah. and yeah it's just a huge liability it's a huge outflow of money consistently from you and that's something you've got to be aware of if you're if you're going to be buying a car And I think the thing that you brought up there is important. This kind of goes back to rich dad, poor dad, Robert Kiyosaki's kind of way of talking about things, is that for most people, they would buy an expensive car and they would think that they have an asset. Yes. Um, And like, as I always say, in the true definition of an asset, an asset is just something that is worth money. Yes. So technically, yeah, if you have a car, sure, you've got an asset. But the, the way that people... Well, the way that wealthy people and people that like to snowball their money, how they think about ass- assets and liabilities is assets put money in your pocket and liabilities take money out of your pocket. Yep. So technically, if you want to look at the basic definition of an asset, yes, a car is an asset. In most of its time, or in basically all of the time that you own it, it acts as though it's a liability because it's constantly taking money out of your pocket. Hmm. So it's, it's important to think about that. Like, yeah, just don't definitely don't go into the process of buying a car thinking that you're buying an asset. I mean, the only way I guess that you could potentially buy an asset is if you're buying, I don't even know, I don't know cars well enough, but perhaps buying one of those really old cars that has, has held its value, but then you're still probably buying a liability because they're going to cost so much in servicing and that sort of thing. Um, But one thing that I did want to bring up as well is that the only, the only reason that I would ever buy an expensive car and this is a quite a relevant topic for kind of the next few years. The only reason that I'd ever buy an expensive car is that I knew the car could make its money or its cost back to me in passive income. And I think this mm. is really interesting because we're, we're kind of getting in towards the territory where we're going to start seeing the fully autonomous electric vehicles like the Teslas rolling around. And we know that Tesla has been talking about um, doing that Tesla network where you can, if you're a Tesla vehicle owner, you can connect your Tesla into the Tesla network and it can be an autonomous taxi. So you don't have to be in the car, but your car could be operating as a taxi, taking people from point A to point B and it could be earning you money. So this is obviously this is very early days of of um, of this kind of technology and early days of even thinking this way about you know autonomous cars and having no driver and that sort of thing, but it's something to consider because this is actually moving. Tesla are really pushing the needle and this is moving quite quickly. They're going to have uh, basically feature complete full self driving by the end of the year, and then it's kind of just down to regular regulatory approval. Mm. But if you were to say, imagine. A scenario where you could buy, sure, it might be an expensive car, sure, it might be a Tesla, and it costs you maybe 60, 70,000 Australian dollars. But at the moment, Tesla are predicting that if you connect your car into that autonomous uh, taxi service system, at the moment, their current estimates is going to uh, earn you about thirty thousand dollars a year. Mm, wow! And that's if you, if that's if half of the half of the time that you don't use the vehicle, you've got it connected to the Tesla network. So pretty crazy. 
And it's something that at least people should start considering into the future, especially with all the major car companies now announcing that they're making moves into the electric vehicle space and the autonomy space is growing and growing, is that maybe you could end up buying a car that actually acts as an asset as well as being an asset. But at the same time, that's a fair way down the track, I think. So, But it's something to think about. Yeah, it's really, really interesting because it's obviously something that I think is inevitable and it's something mm. that we've never seen before, of course. And it, it kind of brings up this new idea of buying cars not to drive at all yourself, but to yeah. just use like as an asset. Yeah, it's kind of like buying a rental property and never living in it. Yeah, uh, exactly. Like, you don't, you don't even use the car. You just buy it because it can make you... You know, twenty percent or thirty percent a year, maybe, or may- maybe a little bit less. But even if it was less, that's still a really good return to be able to make yeah. on an asset like that. So yeah, it kind of flips yeah. the script on Robert Kiyosaki's uh, view on assets and liabilities. It changes a car from something that's an outflow of money to something that's an inflow of money. Yeah, it's just passive income. But you look at like a deal like that in the stock market. If you could make a seventy thousand dollar investment and it gave back to you thirty thousand dollars annually. How good's that for a deal? Yeah. Like, that is a ridiculous return on investment. Yeah. It's crazy. It's going to pay itself back in two and a bit years. It's crazy. Yeah. It's, uh, it's certainly going to be interesting because I think it is inevitable. I mean, yeah, uh, yeah, we're certainly going to see it. Um, okay. So, moving on, we've got the, another one here uh, and this one's a back related to the stock market and this one, <laughs> this money mistake is fearing the stock market. So, I think I spoke about this, I think I touched on this in the other one just a little bit. But I think a lot of people really fear the stock market and it's why they don't mm. start investing when they're younger because they really don't understand it. They think they look at stock charts when they're first starting to invest and they see how they see how unpredictable the short term can be. It's just up and down. Yeah. It's all over the place. There's always, you know, a news thing comes out and a stock gets crushed by 30% on the news because that's all the news really shows when it comes to investing. At least in Australia, that's all I can see is that they only show news re- regards to stocks when there's a stock that's being crushed. <laughs> yeah, yeah, basically. Or something like all that. All news is negative. Yeah, yeah, so people are so scared about this. And um, I think this is a huge problem because... You don't really need to be investing in individual stocks and you don't need to fear the stock market because in the short term, anything can happen, sure. But if you're buying great businesses or if you're widely diversifying across the entire market, over the long term, it's going to go up and you're going to make yeah. a, a good return. Um, yeah. And I think that people sort of get caught up in the in the idea that the stock market is all about price movements and they kind of forget about the fact that you're buying you're buying ownership into businesses that have employees, they have products and they produce cash flow. These businesses yeah. produce money and you're becoming a part owner in that. Uh, and that's what you're actually buying into. And over the long term, good businesses compound their wealth and they compound your wealth as an owner. Yeah. No, I agree. Like if I was a short term investor, I would fear the stock market. <laughs> <laughs> like yeah. I, I don't have me personally. I don't have any fear of the stock market whatsoever. Hashtag mm. no fear. <laughs> <laughs> but if if I was short term minded, if I was a short term investor, if I was like a day trader, I would feel nervous. I I would fear the stock market, and it just goes back to, of course, in the short term. What's the quote? I can't remember. Like in the short term, the market is all can be irrational. Or something like that. But like short term, in the long- short term voting machine, long term weighing machine. Is that the? Yes, yeah, something like that. At, at the end of the day, it's basically all these quotes are just saying that in the short term anything can happen. Okay, but in the long term, things even out to the way that they should be. Hmm. So just stay focused on the long term. Just be a long term investor. I mean, the the data is there. I mean, the most up to date data actually is that um, in the Australian markets anyway, the long term average from uh, 1900 up to 2017, the average annual return is over 10%. Sure, you can have years like 2008 where, you know, the stock market loses literally 30 or 40% in one year and that they're not great times. But if you hold these stocks, if you just diversify across the whole market and you hold it for decades... I mean, objective, the objective data over the past 100 and whatever years, 117 years, has showed that you're probably going to average out to about 10%. Yeah. And there's no 25, more than 25 year period where the stock market's been negative. There's been p- periods where it's been flat or it's been negative, but over right. the very, very long term, it goes up. 
because yeah. because businesses innovate, they create yeah. value, and over the very long term, that means that we can be more productive. And just think of technology. I mean, think of how much more productive we are, and things that we don't have to spend our time doing because of yeah. technology. I mean, it's crazy businesses would have had to do research with books <laughs> before the internet. And think yeah. about how more productive people are that they can find answers instantly now. That's a mm. huge amount of time that they can spend on creating more value. So that that is going to continuously happen. That's never going to yeah. turn around. There's always going to be innovation and we're always going to be more productive, which means that we're going to the businesses are going to increase in value, broadly speaking. Some are going to do bad obviously and some will do better than average. But yeah. If you just invest for the very long term, you've got nothing to worry about. If you don't need the money and if you don't need it for short term expenses and you can ho and you can invest for 25 years or longer or even 20 years, then you've got a very high chance of making money on those investments. A yeah. very, 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 very high chance of making money on those investments and a high chance so, of making a substantial amount. So please don't fear the stock market. Don't do Please it. don't fear it. Fear Bitcoin. Stock market... <laughs> Sorry? Fear Bitcoin. <laughs> fear Bitcoin, but don't fear the stock market. Yeah, geez, I would be nervous if I was invested in Bitcoin. <laughs> I would just have no idea. Jeez, but then again, I don't think anyone really does. But anyway. <laughs> next topic. The next... Oh, here we go. Wind us up here. Wind us up. The this, next this topic, money mistakes. Credit card debt. Oh, my gosh. Oh, my credit cards you want, to you want to take this one <laughs> yeah so the way i like to think of a credit card i think it's i think using a credit card when you don't have the money so there's two ways you can use a credit card let's get a, get out of the way the good way you can use a credit card the good yep. way to use a credit card is if you're responsible with your money and you're yep. just using it uh to get points so you're not yep. spending more than you can afford you're not spending more than usual to get points you're just spending what you have, but doing it on a credit card in order to get points. So yes. you spend it on a credit card and then you pay it off instantly. That's fine. That's that's completely fine. And that's actually uh, a very good tactic if you're good with money because yeah. you can actually uh, be better off than if you didn't have the credit card. Because for one, all of your transactions are secured usually by insurance if you're using a credit card by the bank. Yep. And the other thing is that you make points, which means that uh, over a year or so, you might save up enough for some free flights or something and you can yeah, you know, save yourself sure. some money on a holiday or something like that. That's not what we're talking about. But if you're using a credit card when you don't have the money, so buying things when you actually don't have the money in your account or buying more than you uh, would normally spend in order to make points, that's ah. what... Yeah, that's a big no. That's what I would call an addiction. <laughs> and. Yeah. It's like an addiction because when you start out, you think that it won't get out of hand. You know, you just start out. I see this with so many people and it's really sad. You start out and it's Saturday night and you're getting paid on Wednesday and you don't have any money, but you just use your credit card to buy a few extra drinks when you're out that night. And then yeah. Wednesday comes around, you get paid and you pay off your credit card. And then that continues on for a while. And then eventually you'll just slowly be spending on the credit card and paying it off later and later. Then it'll be yeah. two weeks. Then it'll be three weeks. And then eventually, you're actually paying interest. And having a credit card is what is what I call reverse investing. <laughs> it is. Be well, it is, yeah. Because it's... Yeah, I mean, you're actually giving away 20% or more interest usually uh, yeah. just to buy stuff that kind of just makes you feel happy for a exactly. few seconds. Exactly. Yep. It's, it is, it's negative investing. <laughs> it's taking progress instead of investing where you get progressively more amounts, like higher amounts of money with credit cards, you have to pay increasingly more amounts of money. So it is, it's negative investing. It's horrible. Yeah. And I mean, it's really easy to avoid it. If you have a problem with spending, just don't buy one. Yeah. Just cut just it, don't cut get, it up. Don't, do not get a credit card. I mean, the, the interest rates, like, it's just unreal. Like, long-term annual stock market return, we're talking about maybe around, you know, 8 to 10%. Like, credit card, annual credit card interest rate, 20%, 18%, you know? Just absolutely staggering interest rates on these credit cards. And you can understand with this, like, this high, this high interest rate, how quickly it can snowball you into a huge amount of financial stress. It's just ridiculous. 
So yes, you can always make the argument that credit cards are going to be good if you're good with your own money. But at the end of the day, like I'm good with money and I don't, I'm, I'm scared to get a credit card. I just don't even want to touch it. <laughs> just, uh, yeah. it just kills me. I just don't, don't want it. Don't, don't use credit cards. Don't use credit cards. Don't do it. Anyway, no, don't do it. Right. This video is sponsored by Commonwealth Bank's <laughs> new credit card. <laughs> How funny would that if you get a credit card? Earn 100,000 we'll points if you spend $20,000 in the first month. <laughs> <laughs> 20, holy shit. <laughs> That'd be crazy. Um, all right, what, what have we got? What's our next point? Bad money habits. We've covered a lot so we far. We have, we have. Yeah. Um, but there's more. There is, there is more. There's two, there's two more we've got here if we'll get yeah. to them. Um, and the first one's an interesting one. Um, and I'm interested to hear your thoughts on this. So, yeah. The next money mistake that I think people make is assuming that a university degree is going to be a good investment. Now, yep. before everyone starts screaming at me, there is university degrees that are good investments. What yep. I'm saying is the money mistake is assuming that every degree is a good investment. Just saying, oh, I'm going to uni, therefore it is worth the money that I'm going to spend. And I think that's a mistake. I think yep. that a lot of people just come out of high school and in their mind, in their parents' mind, in their, the t- teacher's mind, it's just, you should go to university because that's the best uh, educational investment you can make right now. And that sort of lapse of not thinking about how much you're spending relative to what you're going to get out of a degree, I think that's a mistake. And I think yep. that a lot of people go to university and they study a very broad, generic degree that, let's be honest, these days, everyone's coming out with a degree. Uh, yep. So, you really don't give yourself much of, of an advantage. And you're sitting there maybe in $30,000 of debt in Australia. Or if you're in the yep. US, it could be hundreds of thousands of dollars of debt. Yeah, much more. So, yeah, I, 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 I'm interested crazy. to hear your thoughts on this. Yeah, the the way that I think about it, and I'll, I'll talk about an example here, is I, I think that this is the way that the story went um, with my cousin. He studied architecture in South Australia, and I believe he finished third highest in his cohort. And when he finished his degree, he was so his third highest in his cohort, and only the top two got jobs. Wow. How crazy is that? Only the, the top, top two. two. Yeah, only the top two got architecture jobs out of his cohort, like straight away coming out of uni. And that's where it kind of like made me think, like, if you go to uni, you got to really make sure that the degree, like, you got to actually think about the employment after that degree. Like, if I do this degree, am I going to get a job? Like, for him, he didn't get a job for a while. I think he had to actually move to Sydney to get a job um, as an architect. I can't remember, but yeah. Um, So definitely think about the employment because some degrees you can get it and you still know better off after you've got it. You still don't have a job. And the other thing that I'd also say is that definitely think about the debt. Think about the debt. At the moment, obviously in Australia, we've got that great system where you've got uh, interest-free um, HEX help loan, which is fantastic. Um, it just get, goes up. It just gets indexed to inflation. So it does go up over time, but at the same rate that inflation goes up. But really think about when you go to uni, like you are putting yourself, you are getting into debt. Mm. So make sure that you're kind of across that. Um, the way that I, the way that I think about going to university now, having been there and done that, is I would say, university, like a bachelor's degree, that's a great achievement for sure. But I would only, I would only commit to doing a university degree if I knew what I wanted to do. And I knew that what I wanted to do required a specific university degree. Yes. Yeah. That's, that's when I would go to uni. Yeah. What worries me is people going to uni because it's kind of the default. And I, I I mean, I'm not completely against people going to uni if they don't know what they want to do, because it's often a place where you can be exposed to a lot of ideas. I mean, for me personally, I really didn't know a whole lot about the stock market before I went to uni, I knew a little bit and I was interested in it, but I went and studied finance and it was at university that I got exposed to a lot of different ideas and that definitely helped guide me in the right direction. But yeah, there's so many people, if you asked, I reckon if you asked, if you surveyed all of university students, I reckon more than half of them wouldn't know how much their uni, uni degree is costing them 
because no, they it, have no idea. I mean, I don't know about your degree, but for me, you just received an email and it had a little statement and it was like, this unit cost a thousand dollars. This unit cost a thousand dollars. Here's your total hex. That's it. Yeah. It's like, there's not really any consideration into it. It's kind of like, this is how much it owes you right now. Zero dollars. You pay nothing now. Doesn't matter how much it is. But with every other expense that you make in life, you actually think about how much you're spending. But yeah. I, I never sat there and I don't think many people would sit there and think, okay, so I'm doing introduction to finance, $1,200. Is that worth it? That's, yeah. that's not a thought you have. You just think, yeah, it's $1,200. All right, I'll pay it sometime in the future because I don't have to pay it right now. And uh, that worries me. And yeah. I, I'm, I don't know about you, but I honestly think that I can see a direction where more people will just move away from generic university degrees, especially with yeah. the internet and uh, ways that you can get specific knowledge on things. You can take courses on a specific thing and learn that thing really well. Um, and it can save you a lot of money. I mean, I've spent, I think my hex is probably $20,000 or something, $30,000. Yeah. Um, yeah, mine's like 30 something. Yeah. yeah. Whereas I've probably spent about maybe four or $5,000 in my business, probably not even that, probably 4000 in my yep. business and I've done quite well with that and I all I wonder is what if I'd just taken that 30 grand and yeah and pumped it into your own business yeah that's exactly right and I think it's it's worth remembering as well that I think this whole school system and university it really just it, it makes workers whereas we're yeah. not really workers we're kind of business people and entrepreneurs so I feel like definitely for for the vast majority of people university will still be popular but amongst entrepreneurs and people that want to kind of take the world on like do it with their own two hands kind of thing then i think that university will just be a kind of fade out because it doesn't it just doesn't give you enough value especially when you could if you like if you put your mind to it you can just start your own business like it, it'll take some some of your own research but you can just do it like i've had absolutely no training in how to start a business but i've done it and I, I think the same as you, if I had not gone to uni and taken that, um, that 30 something thousand dollars and pumped it into my own business, YouTube or whatever, then the return I could have gotten on that would have been much higher than now I've just got $30,000 of debt. <laughs> yeah. I, I see a world where people, uh, a lot more people are making money for themselves, not necessarily by completely just running a business. A lot of people will, of course, be employees. Most people will be employees. But yeah. the internet opens up this space where you can just contract or freelance your own work for a short period of time. And basically, you're the owner of that employment. Like think of something like Fiverr, where there's graphic designers or there's people building websites. You can just do a, you know, a four hour project for someone on Fiverr. And that's technically, it's really a business. That's you yeah. providing your services directly to another person. And I think yeah. we'll see a lot more of that. I think we'll see a lot more of people uh, taking their specialized skills and selling it to people online just because it's so easy in the marketplace. Um, yep. And some people will take that full on and build a business around it, kind of like what we're trying to do. And other people will use it as just a side thing. Um, but yeah, I, I certainly see that being the direction it goes. But yeah. That was kind of our second last one. Just, I, yeah. If you're in high school, I would just say, just really consider the money relative to the employment relative to how much you're going to make out of that. Like, what, what's yeah. the chance of you getting a job? How much are you going to make? How much is it costing you? Is it worth it? And what are your other alternatives? Yeah. Because I wish... Just be smart. Yeah, I wish someone had sort of sat me down and said, look, these are the other options. Just at least consider them. Because yeah, um, exactly. no one really gave me that consideration when I, when I was yeah. starting out. Yeah, I just, I've felt the pressure, like all my friends were going to uni, it's like, all right, I'm going to uni as well. <clears throat> uh, yeah. And even like, even through like year 12, year 11, year 12, and you're working for like an ATAR, if you're doing a tertiary package, or, um, that's that kind of thing. It's just like, there's always, it's always in your brain, like that's your mindset. It's like, I've got to get a good ATAR because I've got to get a good university entrance score and blah, blah, blah. And it's, it's just like, you know, you hear it from your parents, your teachers, your friends. It's just like, your mindset is, is kind of... Is, is guided down that line of I'm going to university kind of thing. So it, yeah, just co just be smart and consider consider what you're what you're going to do. Um, and I think that that kind of this blends in. We'll just briefly touch on this last yeah. one, I think, because that kind of blends into our last money mistake as well. Is is not investing in yourself, and this kind of ties into what we're talking about. People, you know, not taking on and doing their own thing, and you know, going to university and ending up not being able to get employed and 
also having $30,000 of debt is that not investing in yourself, like sometimes the best investments you can make, like even even sometimes better investments than investing in the stock market is investing in yourself. I know that sounds like a watery, like airy fairy answer. It's and true. I hate when people, yeah, I hate when people kind of give these airy fairy answers, but it's, it's really true. Like if you, you can invest in yourself, you can invest in yourself by like upskilling yourself or mm. you can, you, you can invest in yourself by investing in your own business. Because at the moment with this, like, for instance, if you look at my perspective with the stock market being at like record highs and me not doing too much investing at the moment just because everything's so horribly overpriced if i look at that route i'm i'm not earning much money through through that means i know i will in the long term but at the moment it's just like not great conditions for it however at the moment what i'm finding is that i can spend money and invest that into my business and then i can make a better return from doing that so there's always like stock market investing for the long term sure but even in the short term investing in yourself investing in your own business doing your own thing sometimes that can be one of the um, the best things to do and not investing in yourself especially when you're young not taking a chance at doing something that you love or some uh, trying to start a business that you've always dreamed of not taking that chance when you're, especially when you're young and if you've got good surroundings and good, um, you know, support maybe from your parents or your family and that sort of thing, it's a, it's a big mistake, I reckon. That's my personal opinion anyway. Yeah, I agree. Even if you don't want to run a business um, and you, you just want to get a normal job and uh, keep it simple that way, of course, go ahead and do that. But you can just spend a couple of, just dedicate a couple of hours a week and maybe a small amount of your income, maybe 5% of your income or even less or something like that. And just invest in yourself and develop a skill because with, as I spoke about before, with the internet, you can easily see a huge return on your investment just by spending a little bit of time investing in yourself and building up some sort of skill set that you can sell to other people. And uh, yeah, I, I just wish more people had the mindset of uh, making money is essentially just what value can I provide for someone else? What win-win situation yep. can I create where I provide yep. a skill for someone else, someone else is willing to pay for it because they'd rather not spend the time learning that skill. They'd rather spend yep. their money, but I can spend a little bit of time doing it and I can get paid for that. Yep. And that is really everything. It's even employment. Employment is how much value can I provide for this business for the salary that they're going to pay me? And I wish more people had this mindset. And when my eye was opened up to this mindset about value, kind of started with Rich Dad, Poor Dad, I think, but it sort of yep. developed along the way as well. Um, yeah, it, it changed everything once you once you see things that way and you, you see the value of investing in yourself much more. Yep, I definitely agree. Spend, yeah, just spend some money on yourself. It, it'll usually, it turns into a very, very good um, investment. Uh, and with that said, we'll wrap up that second section of the podcast and we will head into just quickly go through some Q&A questions because that actually we've been talking for quite a while. So let's head into some Q&A. Our first question today, what are the most important things to look uh, that you look for when listening to earnings calls? Hamish, what do you reckon? Uh, first thing is political answers. People, uh, management dodging questions and not answering questions, even though people are uh, sort of analysts are coming on and asking the exact same question repeatedly, and they're just dodging it. Um, yeah. And a apart from that, really, I just want to see that they have a technical understanding of the business, that they're not always answering vaguely and they're not just a salesman. I want to know that they're very well personally invested in the business and they can answer specific questions. Yeah. No, I agree. Yeah, you just uh, my my biggest thing, like what you're saying, is I look for them answering with honesty, and answering like they're not trying to hide something. That's basically basically my biggest thing. I mean, I really like earnings calls. Earnings calls are one of my favorite things to do when it comes to investing. Just listening to earnings calls because it gives you so much information, so much information about the business and the management team and whether the management team is just being open and honest that they're trying to hide things or if they're just telling it how it is. Like if you listen to, you can go and listen to Elon at the annual shareholder meeting that's that's on YouTube. It was, it was just a couple of days ago and he's completely open and honest with his shareholders when they ask him questions. Like he's, obviously there's some things that they don't say because they, they're not ready to release that information yet. Um, but generally if someone has a question, they can answer it. They'll answer it as honestly and, and truthfully as they possibly can. Yeah, definitely. And the second and last question that we had for this week was, uh, what does it mean if a company has a negative debt to equity ratio, a negative book value and or a negative uh, price to book? Yeah, I guess 
we were just talking about this before the podcast because, yeah, it's a bit of a weird one, isn't it? But I think that this must just mean that the company has negative um, equity because the if, if we look at debt to equity ratio, book value and price to book, then if the, if the company, the thing that is common throughout here is, is the book value. Hmm. So if it's going to be, if all three of those are going to be negative, then they're going to have negative equity, which basically just means that they have, they're swamped by liabilities and that liabilities are more than what their assets are. Is that right? Yeah. So I guess maybe an easy example to understand would be if a company took on some debt, they'd obviously have more debt and they'd have more cash. So that would balance. But if they spent that cash and nothing came of it, they didn't get any return on that cash. They now have no cash, but they still have the debt. So in that case, you would have no assets, a little bit of debt, which means that you'd have negative equity. You'd have more debt than what the assets are worth, what the book value of the company is. Right. Okay. Cool. Cool. That's it. That makes sense. That's it for yeah, this week. I think that's it. And if you have any questions yeah. for next week, as I said at the start, uh, then go ahead to uh, go over to youtube.com forward slash Hamish Hot Up. That's my channel and you'll be able to find uh, the this episode, the video format. And you can leave yeah. a comment, leave us a question or leave us a topic, anything like that. But uh, thanks for everyone for listening this week and thanks for tuning in. As always, uh, leave us a review. If you if you want, yeah, leave us a review. We had a look at our reviews the other the other day yeah, some, on iTunes. Some really nice you guys reviews. Actually, yeah, yeah, you guys say some nice things. Thank you very thank much. You. We've never looked at our, our reviews before, but thank you very much. And if you do like the podcast, please. Apparently, it helps us a lot if you leave a review. <laughs> <laughs> so please feel free to do that. <laughs> we're so good at this podcasting thing. <laughs> we're we're so good, man. We just know the ins and outs of podcasting, don't we? <laughs> Absolutely. No, uh, yeah. Thanks everyone for listening and uh, we'll be back next week with a guest podcast actually. So uh, you can look forward to that one. That'll be really exciting. That'll be on Brandon's channel. So, and of course it'll be on Spotify and iTunes. Yep. Cool. All right. Well, uh, that's all for this week. Uh, Thanks for listening and see you later guys. Bye-bye.